Hi, I'm Adam Culp, and you're at BeachCast. Let's talk about the true costs of programming errors and buggy software. So stick around, and we'll get right on that. I'm going to share a lot of articles coming up and keep in mind that down in the description, if you want to read some of these articles in more depth that I'm going to share data from, go down and click on those links in the description. There's a lot of good articles there, a lot of good information on refactoring. One of those was in relation to cost offsetting. There was a person named John Vergolino who came up with a little bit of a model that we could share with business to help them understand this a little bit better. And what he said was, if you were to spend three days refactoring an application and making the code cleaner, making things a little bit better, and then in the future, a feature request came up, and that feature request was about a five-day request. It was, it was estimated that it would take about five days in order to do that feature. However, if you had done the refactoring prior to taking on the five-day project, maybe you could get it done in one day because the refactoring is already done. The brain work, the, the, the strategizing of how to do the refactoring would have already been tackled. Therefore, the feature would take less time. Now, in another section of a different article, I found something a little bit more along the lines of making sure that ROI is justified. And Simon Johnson stated that if you are not able to show how you could improve productivity by 5 to 8%, chances are business would not pay attention. It really takes a decent ROI for business to be able to look at it and say, okay, that makes sense to me but you have to quantify that. If you can't quantify it, you're never going to get business on your side. And business people, I totally understand it's very difficult for you to be able to justify things if the dollars and cents aren't there. Now, there are some things from a business standpoint that make it almost impossible to justify regular refactoring and doing things in that way such as maybe there are strategic decisions that had to be made for new features or new parts of an application being put on. Maybe it's contractual. Maybe you only have a certain amount of time for the human resources that you wanted to attribute to the project, and you have to make sure that certain things get done in a certain time period. Or maybe it's contractual with the customer, where the customer wants something in a specific amount of time. It's hard to justify cleaning up the code and then doing the new feature rather than just doing the new feature in certain circumstances. It's just common sense. As developers, when you're trying to speak with business and asking them to allocate this time for refactoring, make sure you get the whole story. Make sure you understand why business is making the decisions they're making and understand the whole picture so that way you can better help business. From personal experiences, I know that at the end of the day, developers just want to help the customer who, in this case, it's business in this example. So we have to make sure that we have all the facts in place so that we're ensuring that we do that. Another possible reason that a negative decision might need to be made is because of project lifespan. Maybe the project lifespan is just too short that it really doesn't pay to do certain things. Now, on the other hand, it's also really important to understand the finances and the costs involved. In 2003, there was a study done by the Department of Commerce's National Institute of Standards and Technology. They found that software bugs cost the U.S. economy $59.5 billion annually. Now, that has exponentially increased over recent years, and I have another new number for you that's significantly higher than that. That was in 2003 when they did that study. As some examples, if we take a look at 1962, in 1962, NASA launched the Mariner 1, and about 290 seconds after takeoff, the safety officer had to hit the self-destruct button. And the reason was because the craft had gone so far off course and it was in danger of many different catastrophes that could have happened. So the self-destruct was really the wisest choice. That result of hitting the self-destruct button cost $18 million at that time. Upon looking at it a little bit later, they discovered there was only one error that caused it. It was a hyphen that was missed in the programming. 
More recently, in 2009, you may recall where Toyota was having troubles with the accelerator sticking. And they found, ultimately, that it was due to the anti-lock braking software having a bug that caused it to malfunction. Unfortunately, it resulted in deaths. There were people that were actually killed in the accidents due to this failure. They did put out some software updates that overrode the gas pedal. So that way, when the brake pedal was hit, it overrode the gas pedal and, and that enabled them to be able to fix the issue. It affected 9 million cars. And the total, the total dollars associated with that was about 3 billion. So again, software issues, even the sm small ones can cause really big ramifications. Another recent example from 2012 is where the Knight Capital Group uh, had an error in their software and it caused 4 million stock orders in an hour. It cost them about $12 billion to reverse those trades. And that was due to just a code change not being pushed to all the servers. The total loss of that was $440 million. Now, as I said, uh, the 2003 study from the Department of Commerce showed that it was about $59.5 billion annually. However, in 2017, Tricentis from Tricentis.com did a study and they found that software failures cost the economy $1.7 trillion. And that was up from 2016, where the cost was $1.1 trillion. So again, a lot of money attributed to software bugs and issues with software being buggy. That study was actually done over 314 companies, which those bugs affected 3.6 billion people. That's a lot of people who are affected by faulty software. The relative downtime experienced by these 3.6 billion people came out to the equivalent of 268 years of lost downtime. 268 years of time. That's huge. All from software bugs. In that same time period, Raygun reported that they experienced about 7.7 .7 billion errors. That's about 21 million errors per day being recorded by software. The System Sciences Institute at IBM did a study, and what they found is that uh, if a bug was found in development, let's say that the bug was $100, okay, to fix the bug. If they found that bug in development, it cost $100 to fix. However, if the bug made it to the implementation phase, at that point, the bug was about 6.5 times more expensive to fix. So that $100 bug now costs $650 to fix. If it made it as far as QA, when the testers were testing for it, they found that it was 15 times more expensive to fix. So now that $100 bug is now $1,500 to fix. However, if the bug made it all the way to production, it became 100 times more expensive to fix that bug in production. So a $100 bug is now $10,000 to fix. And, and those are the raw numbers that they found through their study. That can be really expensive, especially when you take into consideration the man hours. You know, granted, dollars is one thing, but the man hours and the time also go into that. Uh, where, you know, in, in development, of course, the time is, is much smaller than the time if it made it all the way to production. And now you've involved QA people, you've involved managers, you've involved uh, people on call expected to handle the issue and so forth. Now, Raygun also did a similar study. And what they found is if, if a bug is found during conception of the software, it's a 1x fix, so, you know, $100. If, they, if the bug was then found in the design phase, it was 10x uh, as far as the cost to fix it at that time. If it made it to development, it was 100 times. If it made it all the way to testing and QA, then it was 1,000 times the, the cost to fix it. And if it was then released into production, it became 10,000 times to fix it. And that study is more recent. The IBM one's a little bit older. The Raygun is a little bit more recent. Um, so take that as you will. 
But either way, exponentially, it's a lot more expensive to find a bug if you don't find it during the requirements phase and if you don't find it during the development phases. That's the best time to find a bug. And refactoring can often play a part in that and find bugs a lot earlier in the process. Similarly, we can also track when bugs enter into the process, right? Where in the development life cycle are the most bugs introduced? There was a, uh, an article in Computer Finance Magazine where they found that errors are more frequently introduced in, the, in design documents than they are in the code itself. What they found is during requirements gathering, that's when about 20% of bugs are introduced. Then in the design stage, about 25% of bugs are introduced. And then going forward, while the coding is being done, 35% of bugs are introduced then. And then, of course, you have the user's manuals as the documentation is being created. That's where about 12% of bugs are introduced. And then you have uh, the bad fixes themselves, and those are the bug fixes themselves. And that's when 8% of bugs are actually introduced. This is during the bug fix uh, of, of 8%. Now, in crosstalk, uh, the Journal of Defense Software Engineering, they did something similar, and they found that 64% of defects were created in the requirements and the design phases. However, 36% of the defects were created in the coding and implementation phase. So again, both of those studies kind of substantiate how important proper requirements gathering uh, in, and everything else can really attribute to the bugs being introduced. And that's at the time when they cost the least to fix. So if we pay closer attention to requirements gathering, if we pay closer attention to those early stages uh, in finding those bugs, then we can really make software a lot more cost effective. In relation to that, I've spent most of my life doing web development. And along the lines of web development, the speed of an application, the speed of a web page coming up can often play a part in customer satisfaction. And bugs can severely hinder that and cause things to slow down. So in that report from Raygun, they polled their customers to kind of figure out a little bit more of where does dissatisfaction come from in relation to speed of the application. And what they found was that 47% of customers expected sub two second load times of applications. That means that the applications, they expected them to render in their browser within two seconds. They also found that 40% of people abandoned the site completely if the site took longer than three seconds to load. That's fast and that time continues to get shorter. Out of those people who do abandon the site, 79% of them never return. That's almost half the customers that abandoned the site because it took longer than three seconds, almost half. And out of that three quarters don't go back. Further, customers stated that 52% attribute fast load times to loyalty. So they are more loyal to a business that are more loyal to a company if load times are faster. And they also noticed that those slow load times, every second hindered the satisfaction of a customer by 16%. So 16% reduction of satisfaction per second. And out of all those people who are dissatisfied from their speed, 44% tell their friends about it. Another thing we might wanna take into consideration as it relates to speed is, how fast can developers create new features? How long does it take a developer to create new functionality based on requirements, based on the vision of the business person? Well, in a book that I think many developers are familiar with called Clean Code by Robert C. Martin, also known as Uncle Bob, he contends that developers spend 90% of their time reading code and only about 10% of their time adding new code. That's a lot of time. If we work re regular refactoring into our software lifecycle, this greatly improves the quality of the code. It's easier to teach developers how to abide by certain conventions and also how to read the code because some of it can now become intuitive based on these conventions. So theoretically, a developer should be able to create code faster. 
thereby reducing the 90% of time reading code and maybe having more time to create new functionality. I hope you found this video helpful. I will leave a lot of comments uh, down below. I'll put links to all the articles that I referenced throughout this uh, video. And I'll also put some additional things down there to help you out too. If you found this video helpful, please like the video. It helps other people find the video and makes it more discoverable on YouTube. I really appreciate your help with that. And above all, be good to yourself and others, and I'll see you next time.